Today on MuggleCast, Chapter by Chapter returns with our analysis of Prisoner of Azkaban, Chapter 18. This week's episode is sponsored by Indeed. If you're hiring for your business on your own, you're basically Hermione trying to take too many classes at Hogwarts. You just need to breathe, take it easy, and keep it simple. If you're hiring, you need Indeed, and here's why. Indeed is the hiring platform where you can attract, interview, and hire all in one place. Instead of spending hours on multiple job sites searching for candidates with the right skills, use Indeed, a powerful hiring platform that can help you do it all. I think their best feature is Indeed Instant Match, which takes care of the hard, tedious work for you. Indeed's hiring platform matches you with quality candidates instantly. And candidates you invite to apply are three times more likely to apply to your job than candidates who only see it in search, according to U.S. Indeed data. Even better, Indeed's the only job site where you only pay for applications that meet your must-have requirements. Start hiring now with a $75 sponsored job credit to upgrade your job post at Indeed.com slash MuggleCast. Offer good for a limited time. Claim your $75 credit now at Indeed.com slash MuggleCast. Just go to Indeed.com slash MuggleCast and support the show by saying you heard about it on this podcast. Indeed.com slash MuggleCast. Terms and conditions apply. Need to hire? You need Indeed. Welcome to MuggleCast, your weekly ride into the Wizarding World fandom. I'm Andrew. I'm Eric. I'm Micah. And I'm Laura. This week, it's going to feel like your worst Thanksgiving dinner because we're discussing Chapter 18 of Prisoner of Azkaban, Mooney, Wormtail, Padfoot, and Prongs. And to help us with today's discussion, we're joined by another Slug Club supporter on Patreon. His name is Jason, not to be confused with our last guest, also Jason. That's a first, I think. Welcome, Jason, to the show. Hello. I'm excited to be here. Good to have you. You're coming to us from Salt Lake City. And let's get your fandom ID. Oh, sure. So, yeah. So my favorite book is, I can't decide. It's three, I think, maybe six. Um, Could be five. I don't know. I like all of those for very different reasons. (laughs) I really can't decide which one is my favorite. I like all of them. Favorite movie is the sixth one, probably. I also really like the fifth one. I don't know. I'm very indecisive. (laughs) I am Hufflepuff. I have also secondarily been sorted into Ravenclaw, so I'm probably more of like a Huffleclaw. My Patronus is a Tonkinese cat, which I, I don't know what a Tonkinese cat is, but I like cats, so that's cool. (laughs) <laughs> and then um, my animagus form, I think I would be a falcon. Cool. And we asked that question because it's relevant to today's chapter. I appreciate your honesty with the indecisiveness around what your favorite book and movie is. I'm like, I like all of them. I don't know. <laughs> Too often people feel they have to give a definitive answer. And then so that we can scrutinize it. It's like, but this one, there's nothing to pick at. It's like, oh, he likes a bunch of them. Okay. But let's put it to you this way. If you were stranded on a desert island and you only had, <laughs> and you could only bring one book with you, which would it be? Three, six, or five? Uh, uh, I don't know. <laughs> Five, probably, maybe, because it's long. Yeah, it's the longest. Well That's reasoned. <laughs> well reasoned. It's also your favorite book, isn't it, Andrew? That is my favorite. Yeah, number five. No doubt about it for me. So um, if we're both on the same island, I'll bring, you know, I'll have five there, and then you You'll can bring to three or six. Right. Planning to get stranded on an island. Yeah. <laughs> Somebody bring two. We need two. We don't have we need two to- yet. <laughs> well, welcome to the show, Jason, and thanks for your support on Patreon. Yeah, we really appreciate your support. And you put in some great notes today that we're excited to talk about. Um, Micah, Eric, you have some updates for us. Micah, do you want to start? Yeah, sure. So we were able to give away a couple of pairs of tickets to Harry Potter, the exhibition back on Harry's birthday. And uh, appropriately, I thought the question was, in the Hall of Prophecy, which row contains the prophecy about Harry and Voldemort. Does anybody here know the answer to that? It's 97, isn't it? It is 97. Eric, congratulations. You've won two tickets. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) 
So congratulations to Laura. Not you, Laura. Another Laura. Oh, man. Sorry. Man, we have too many. There's too many Jasons, too many Lauras. Like, what <laughs> is going on? Well, Laura Morrow, who is one of our longstanding Snow oh. Club members. So she is very excited to go. As well as Marlena, Matthew, Michael, and Layla. So we really hope you enjoy your time at Harry Potter the Exhibition. And channeling my inner Chloe, be sure to tag us on social media <laughs> when you do decide to go. It is a lot of fun. I've been, and uh, I know you're going to really, really enjoy yourselves at the exhibition. Well, jumping off of that, Micah and I would like to thank anyone who came out to see us while we were in Chicago, either at LeakyCon, which was another wonderful, amazing time, or at the uh, public MuggleCast meetup, which uh, nevertheless had a limited amount of space. But we filled up uh, the top floor of Fado Irish Pub downtown in Chicago, one of Micah and I's favorite spots to go when we're not hosting a MuggleCast live. And we managed to finally have our party there. And it was really, really wonderful uh, seeing everybody, making time to chat with everyone that came. And it was really just a magical weekend. Yeah. And uh, we got to see, as you said, a number of listeners. But I, I did want to specially call out, uh, we were doing our Spot the Liar panel on Sunday. And right after the panel, there were these two kids that came up to us. And they said, we're bagels for Buckbeak. And it took me a second to register exactly what they were saying. And then I realized, oh, Quizage. But uh, <laughs> it was so cool to meet them in person. And they drove all the way from Virginia wow. to come to LeakyCon and just for that day specifically. So it was really great to see them. We got a picture with them, and I'm sure it will be posted up on social media uh, at some point. Uh, the kids are soon. really loving Quizich, it turns out, uh, because we got Forrest, the 14-year-old. Bagels for Buckbeak, uh, their parents confided are 12 and 13. So definitely good for the young young kids. Yeah, we this weekend for Qu Quizich people, we met Bagels for Buckbeak, and I discovered that I had uh, actually shared a hotel room with when the shrieking shack is rocking, don't come knocking. <laughs> okay, that would be me. Which is one of Micah's oh. previous Quizich handles. So okay, I was gonna say I thought we were gonna have to get in touch with HR. But anyway, <laughs> um, it was really a wonderful time, and uh, yeah, we definitely have a lot of our recaps uh, up on our socials. And yeah, I would just have to say, um, probably the panels were my favorite thing of the whole weekend, um, including one on the morality of magic, which had a lot of audience participation. So for me, it, it was definitely the Muggle Cast meetup. And then also the very first panel that we did, which was a podcaster mega panel, uh, a number of fellow podcasters, either that we've been on their shows or they've come on this one. Mike from Potter List, Fanatical Fix, and where to find them, as well as Swish and Flickcast. So, oh, and and uh, was that the one Gilderoy Lockhart came to, or that was uh, no, that was that content was Friday. Creators the next day, yeah, got no, it. Gilderoy got it, got appeared it. on Saturday in full regalia, and Eric was Lockhart. Plenty of arrogance, and also Elvis Dumbledore. Yes, his his classic Elvis Dumbledore, <laughs> <laughs> and I think. I think I said that Gilderoy appeared on Saturday. That's not true. He was just resting in Friday morning for the. He couldn't make the first panel, you know, the arrogance. That's right. He's, but he's got many obligations. He showed up later on uh, Friday yeah. afternoon, and and we did do six panels in total, in addition to the meetup. And I believe we're planning to release our live show on Labor Day weekend. Yeah, which was a lot of fun it was as well. A lot of fun. Cool. They did wrap up by announcing that LeakyCon will be in Portland next year, returning to Portland. I don't, Eric, were you there last time? Yeah, 2013, I want to say. It was really good. Get some voodoo donuts while you're there. Well, we are glad you had a great time at LeakyCon and hope all of our listeners who went also had a great time as well. Sounds like a lot of fun. One other quick little announcement. Very exciting news for those of you who listen to MuggleCast on Spotify. If you are a patron, you can now listen to our bonus audio content like bonus MuggleCast and ad-free MuggleCast right within the Spotify app. Spotify and Patreon partnered 
to uh, create an integration. It's very nice. It's very easy to set up. You just go into Spotify. You uh, go to our show. You click the Patreon banner you see there. It says exclusive episodes for subscribers. And then you can connect your Patreon account to Spotify. And then you'll get access to this feed where you will see all of our bonus audio content. Again, ad-free MuggleCast and bonus MuggleCast installments, as well as any other bonus audio content that we do post on Patreon, which does happen from time to time. So definitely check that out. We'll have a link in the show notes. If you use Spotify but aren't a patron yet, this is a great way to support us and enjoy our twice-monthly bonus MuggleCast segments, as well as ad-free MuggleCast. No matter what podcast app you use, we would appreciate your support on Patreon as it's what keeps the show running. We have tons of perks you can enjoy in exchange for supporting us, plus closer access to us. So check it out today and help us run the show. Thank you, everybody. And now with that, let's get to chapter by chapter. This week, we're discussing chapter 18 of Prisoner of Azkaban, Jason's favorite book. Mooney, Wormtail, <laughs> Padfoot. <laughs> and good frog. We're just gonna, to choose his, from. We're just going to tell him what his favorite book is now. <laughs> his favorite book, so long as he's not stranded on a desert island, then it's Order of the Phoenix. Yes. <laughs> or Half-Blood. Yeah. All right. So we will start, as always, with our seven-word summary. Lupin. Reveals. Backstory. Two. Many. Children. Ta da. <laughs> <laughs> That's fine. <laughs> the dream scenario would have been many scared children or something like that. Oh, yeah. Or too many, too many shocking yeah. or gasps or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I botched that. I'll blame myself. It's, it's okay. Honestly, it's okay. It's I love it when we have to end our seven word summary in like a ta da or hooray. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> we love it. We'll just have to see how we'll just have to see how the listeners feel about it uh, because we are ranking these again on OWL grading scales. It was something that that kind of shocked me going into this chapter is, you know, we're at the end of this book and all the chapters do tend to bleed together. They they all are set like within minutes or immediately after each other. Um, and they're all roughly about 25 pages or so, maybe like 20, 25 pages. Not this one. Chapter 18, Mooney, Wormtail, Padfoot and Prongs is only nine pages long. And it's a quick read. Jim Dale gets through it in like 18 minutes and it's actually closer to 14 if you put him on 1.2 speed, which I do. <laughs> so it's a quick chapter. I've actually managed to listen to it like four times to prep for this. Oh, nice. Because it's so it's so short. Yeah. Um, when you called this out, yeah, I, I was wondering, to... is it the shortest yeah. chapter in the series? So I did a quick Google and the answer is no. However, it looks like the shortest chapter in the series is actually two chapters from now. Chapter 20, oh, The Dementor's Kiss, gosh. at 2018 oh, words. So I know we'll get into what does happen in this chapter, and we do have some fun kind of like food for thought and uh, stuff from Potter No More to discuss as well to kind of flesh out discussion. But going into how short this chapter is uh, and asking myself why that might be, it does cover a very specific set of events, which is at the beginning of the chapter, they finish after the big reveal of last chapter that Scabbers is Peter Pettigrew. They stop talking about Peter Pettigrew so that Lupin can tell his whole werewolf backstory story. But that happens where they change topic right as Snape comes in. So we know that Severus Snape sneaks in under the invisibility cloak. That's the big reveal at the end of this chapter. But so all this stuff about Scabbers being Peter Pettigrew is actually... Um, very specifically out of his earshot. So later, when the children have to fight with Dumbledore and Fudge about, oh, no, we really saw Peter. He's really alive. Snape, who's being awful, not to get too ahead of ourselves, uh, really actually didn't hear anything about, about Peter. So maybe the reason that this is a separate chapter is just like for the author to very specifically have this set of events be focused on as one specific thing. Does that make sense to you guys? I think so. And you see each chapter end on a cliffhanger quite a bit. And there was a cliffhanger mm. at the end of the previous chapter, too. So I'm thinking maybe that's why. But you also have to wonder, maybe this was an editor decision, too. Like, hey, this is a little 
this chapter is getting a little long, the previous chapter, I mean. Let's maybe split it right mm-hmm. here where there could be a nice cliffhanger. Because you also think about the chapter titles. They're so similar, <laughs> which we spoke about. Yeah. yeah. Right. So getting into the events of the chapter, and Lupin has just revealed that Scabbers the Rat is an animagus named Peter Pettigrew. Uh, Sirius is really kind of out of control. He leaps onto Ron, who is injured already, and is only stopped by Lupin saying very loudly that the children have a right to know. And... I mean, it's funny because Sirius has this great line at the beginning of the chapter. I'd like to commit the murder I was imprisoned for. Great line. But Sirius really has no concept or seems to care at all about what leaving Pettigrew alive would do in a sense of clearing his own name. Sirius is not trying to reveal the fraud. He's not trying to reveal Pettigrew so that he could get his life back. He actually just wants to kill him. And so why so why so little regard for himself in this matter? And you all know my feelings on Sirius Black being like my favorite character. But I dare to ask the question, is it charming that Sirius just wants to commit the murder and not save himself? I think it speaks to his mental state. Yes, I was going to say, I think it's actually really sad Um, when I was thinking about this question. I was thinking about um, his first attempt, his failed attempt to kill Peter. He did it in front of a street of witnesses. So clearly after losing his best friend and, you know, you know, Lily and, you know, presumably his godson, because they're not going to let him live with Sirius. He probably feels like he's a marked man and that nothing he can do will ever erase the stigma of being believed to have been the person who betrayed the Potters. So he doesn't think he has any life to live for at this point. And that is such a a dark thought, I know. But if you think about the fact that Sirius spent the prime years of his life imprisoned uh, when he was actually innocent... So much of his life has already been lost, and he's had 12 years to stew on this betrayal. And ultimately, it's been, I I think, probably one of the only things that he has thought about for that period of time. So what's his motivation apart from getting revenge on Peter at this point? Right. That is such an interesting Point. He can't know that Lupin is going to show up. Right. So the motivation, as you said, Laura, is to kill Pettigrew. That's been his mission ever since he saw him in the Daily Prophet back in Azkaban yeah. was to escape and to pay back Peter for everything that he has put Sirius through over the course of the last 12 years. So certainly things change once Lupin arrives and you would think that Sirius would want to approach things a little bit differently now that you actually have somebody there who can validate your claim. But going back to the point that was mentioned about mental state, I think it's just like blinders are on and he's got one clear objective and nothing is going to stop him from doing that. And nine pages long, they could have fit this in the damn movie. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh. Parts of it are in the movie, but the whole Marauders reveal isn't, which is a joke. But that's a conversation for another time. Yeah. Yeah. We know the argument about making something Harry's story, but they're literally telling this story to Harry and it affects his parents. So anyway, while we are on the subject of the movie, I will just add that I loved this scene in the movie this this broader scene i still remember going to the movie and leaning forward in my seat when like snape appeared i was like oh my gosh this is a soap opera this is good this is juicy (laughs) this is twisty because you're seeing all these iconic actors working together as the kids sort of like take a back seat oh i'll never forget that feeling of just like being like so into it (laughs) 
still bickering like an old married couple, right? That's the- <laughs> no. Yeah, I do love that. No, the scene is really good. Um, but I will agree that the biggest miss of the third movie was not introducing the marauders or explaining yeah. their backstory or connection to the overall plot. A hundred percent. Lupin, how do you know how the map works? I know. That is the reason why I saw the third movie in theaters and then refused to watch it for many years after I hated it. I was so mad because oh. of that omission. I've since rewatched it and I actually really, really enjoyed the movie, but that still really bothers me. <laughs> I feel yeah. it. I feel it's a it. glaring issue for sure. When we talk about Sirius's you know, single mindedness, uh, Laura, and what you said about he has little to live for, it occurred to me that it isn't really until Harry like offers to live with Sirius that Sirius thinks for the first time that there is a future really at all, like one worth living kind of in a way. Hey, really, um, really quickly, though, I mm-hmm. think that Marauder scene, it needs to be in the TV show. Should we max that? Oh, it's got to be maxed. Max. Oh, <laughs> oh, mm-hmm. max that. Max that. They wouldn't make the same mistake twice, would they? <laughs> <laughs> I hope not. But you can also think about how when we do learn about the Marauders, we could get flashback scenes there to them uh, becoming anime guy, as we'll talk about in a little bit. Yeah. And for the love of God, cast the Marauders and give them actual lines. None of this three second flashback, everything happening at once kind of crap that the whole way when we did get anything Marauders related, even like Snape's worst memory in five um, or the Prince's Tale in 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 eight. Um, it's just way glossed over and nobody ever took the time for it. So here's something else <laughs> that's happening at the beginning of this chapter. Scabbers is struggling to get free. Obviously, we know why. And Ron is doing his damnedest to hold him, but his hands are cut up. They're bleeding. It's actually really difficult to read, kind of like Ron. And they're all having this conversation about Peter and Scabbers and all this stuff. And it's like, at one point, Sirius leaps onto Ron. Ron falls back on his broken leg. And the whole time, amid all that pain, is still holding onto Scabbers. My question is, isn't there some kind of magical stasis? Like we we can talk about this, but we've literally seen like what Hermione does with the Cornish Pixies, what like Arresto Momentum is a thing that Dumbledore does. Like there has to be some way where Ron doesn't have to hold Scabbers who's scraping his hands to get out while they have a human conversation. These adult wizards, let's just say Lupin as a teacher, should have some kind of solution for this. Oh yeah. Levioso. <laughs> Create a cage out of thin air, a little tiny rat cage. A little, a little, a little teeny little rat cage, yeah. I'll put, put him in a rat wheel that he can't get out of, the spinning oh wheel, like gosh. a hamster wheel. Yeah, that way he can run. He just won't go anywhere. Ah, yeah, there yeah. you go. And generate a little energy in the process. This is kind of those, this is like where this book is my favorite, I can say without any uncertainty, um, but uh, not trying to show you up there, Jason. I appreciate uh, your indecisiveness. <laughs> But um, but I would say, well, six is another one. But yeah, I would say that there are these moments here twice in this chapter, I think, where there's magic that the teachers should know that they don't use. Um, And so we'll get into that. But sort of the main point of this chapter is to have Lupin be able to tell the story of how Harry's dad and his friends all became animagi to be with Lupin during his werewolf transformation. So it's a great story we'll get into. And essentially, it comes down to Lupin was bitten as a child, and he would not normally have been able to attend Hogwarts if it weren't for one headmaster, Albus, formerly Elvis Dumbledore, uh, deciding that the precautions can be taken to make it possible. And this speaks to a lot of prejudice that exists about werewolves. Yeah, it definitely does. And one of the things that came to mind for me was that it demonstrates that throughout the course of wizarding history, as far as we know, there's been no strong desire for the wizarding community to invest in ways to either cure lycanthropy or better integrate werewolves into wizarding society. And 
this is not a 20th century issue. Presumably werewolves have been around for hundreds or thousands of years prior to this. And Lupin can have been the first werewolf to attend Hogwarts, whether folks knew about it or not. And so I was wondering, should there be a school specifically for werewolves and other wizarding world beings or creatures, or does that defeat the entire purpose of having an integrated magical society? I do think the latter. Yeah. But it, but they still need some sort of support group at the school, not just a place for a type of place for them to go and hide. It should be like you think about in high school, you see the LGBTQ ally groups, like maybe something like that, just so they feel left less alone and they feel more supported. Yeah. I mean, how do you feel it defeats the purpose of the magical? What does that mean? Well, I was saying would creating a school specifically for werewolves defeat the purpose of trying to have a more because then they feel society. like other other yeah yeah but like without providing resources for these very real people that have this you know they've been cursed um the then you're really dooming them uh to a life of of otherness and it, it's a lot worse than what dumbledore does I, um I, so yeah i, I I think you could look at what Dumbledore does through two separate lenses. I think you could look at it through the lens of him helping Lupin and providing a place for him to actually transform. But at the same time, he's not doing anything to try and integrate him into the larger school community that's there. And, you know, outing Lupin, outing Lupin would be a terrible thing, obviously. But I just think that maybe Dumbledore could have taken other steps during normal school hours to try and make Lupin feel more welcome and, you know, teach the students essentially that what Lupin mm. is going through is normal. Yeah. Even though that's not how tolerance. the kids would initially perceive it. And wasn't his yeah. fault. But also, I don't think anyone in Lupin's position wants to be like an object lesson for other people mm. that would probably be pretty uncomfortable. And probably one of the best things that Dumbledore could do for Lupin is make his schooling experience as normal as possible. Right. So y'all know that I'm not a Dumbledore apologist here, but I think that given the circumstances and the lack of resources, the lack of social understanding and the lack of like any kind of government support or medicinal remedy at this point, I think Dumbledore actually did the best he could here. This is a it's rare possible. moment. I'm defending <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> well, well, yeah. Dumbledore, uh, I, but he doesn't make Lupin feel comfortable necessarily. It's James, Sirius, and Peter that ultimately make well, Lupin feel comfortable because they go the extra mile to become anime guy and it's you know, still be his friend in that form as much as they are when they're in human form. There is there is that question about what is the responsibility of the administrator and the administrator answers to the safety of all the students, right? Um, it's said multiple times in this chapter that, that werewolves really are dangerous. Uh, if Snape had encountered had encountered Lupin when he was, you know, in his werewolf form, he says it would have been awful. And James, who at that time was uh, able to transform, still put himself in great risk, according to Lupin, for pulling Snape back um, while he was human. So there's apparently this huge danger that, again, is not really fleshed out. But it just shows that I think Dumbledore's responsibility ends at making Lupin's transformations safe to the rest of the students um and then as you point out though micah there was a vacuum of the emotional fulfillment that could only be i think filled by friends who would do this sort of thing that they ended up doing for lupin yeah and i think in that and i mean this is just me trying to kind of put myself in lupin's shoes if I were in his position, I don't know that I would want a school administrator facilitating 
my friendships for me to help me feel included because that just feels it feels like it's done out of pity and I don't want that. Um, so it's probably a lot more gratifying for Lupin that he made these friends organically and because of what good friends they ended up being, they did this objectively selfless thing for him. It was dangerous, but they did it. I think the other yeah. question is what does Lupin want? Does he want other students to know that he's a werewolf in a way that is safe and won't uh, scare people off from him? Like, what does he want? Mm. I think that's the main question we would need to be asking Lupin. Well, I think inevitably you'd get those teacher or you get those students that would go looking for the troll. You know, they'd go looking for the werewolf if, if Lupin had been outed mm. and that would have been a whole nightmare. I think, too, the thing is Lupin just wanted to be normal. Like, like yeah. he wanted to be somewhere safe to and that and when you're a kid, you absolutely want to blend in. Right. You you want nobody to know. I think that maybe outing Lupin to a school body or saying werewolves are safe or, or uh, teaching tolerance may have been in the cards after like immediately after seven successful years of hiding it. Right. Like I can see if the first war hadn't de like derailed everything with Voldemort and everything, I can easily see the teachers then going for seven years. We have had a werewolf at our school and it was safe objectively except for one run-in with severus snape uh the whole time so this is an example let this be an example to all other schools everywhere and let this be an example to the student body that these people suffering from this affliction can be safely educated along with the rest of us and that would have led this whole werewolf rights kind of organization but Voldemort you, happened yeah you bring up an interesting point i almost wonder if you could bring in an adult or a group of adults who are werewolves and could teach this younger generation what to do when they transform. It seems to be that in this particularly this particular wizarding world, you kind of lose all sense of yourself, regardless of whether or not you're a child or you're an adult. But I think we've seen in other series, like there is some level of you know, awareness when you transform into a werewolf and being able to control your abilities. So I wonder if that could be something down the line that they do explore uh, at Hogwarts. So Potter No More actually went into some of the backstory of Remus Lupin. It's a good, pretty long article. Um, but the key moment here is that Lupin's father, uh, Lyle Lupin, had a moment of prejudice, um, essentially, Lyle was at the Ministry of Magic and made a negative comment about werewolves in front of Fenrir Greyback, who basically was shocked by the lack of Lyle's humanity and compassion toward werewolves and decided to retaliate. And nothing can um, forgive what Greyback does and the methods of going about it. But you do kind of understand in that moment the motivation of essentially Lyle Lupin said an unkind thing. He said that werewolves were soulless and deserved death and could not be rehabilitated. And you can easily look at many examples of people who are in a minority group that are outcasts that receive or are on the receiving end of these horrible statements uh, and backed into a corner um, about this and viewed as less than just because of their afflictions. Yeah. And we learn later, of course, that Fenrir kind of makes a name for himself, wanting to bite children as young as he as young as possible to turn them when they're young, which adds a whole other messed up layer to his character because he can't he can't play the victim card. At that point, when you take, um, you know, somebody's horrible, um, you know, reprehensible behavior towards you and it fuels and motivates you to do something 10 times more heinous than words could ever be. No sympathy. <laughs> yeah, I mean, no sympathy, but it's interesting how we all have those moments where like a prejudice maybe we aren't even weren't even aware mm -hmm. of came out or we say things that we really don't mean. 
And this was a very real percussion, especially in a world that existed before the Wolfsbane potion, which is still, as Lupin says, pretty uncomfortable, but he's able to bear it. He's able to bear his transformation now. Um, it's just a really bad situation. Well, and speaking of Fenrir making an example out of young Remus, I was think I this backstory is very interesting. I'm not sure I had read it before. And it just made me think about how this is another example of a character paying for the decisions of their dad or what their what happened Ooh, to their dad. Yep. You look at James or Harry kind of paying in a way for what happened to James and Draco paying for um how evil his father is. And here's another example of that. Remus is paying for um what happened to his dad. So what not, went down yeah, with not, his dad? Not only how evil his father is, but how much of a screw up his father is, because that's what leads to Voldemort wanting to recruit Draco and use him as a pawn in his larger right. game. Mm -hmm. It is interesting to see how the threads all connect, even though even though this Lyle Lupin stuff was revealed on Pottermore years after the books had ended, um, the thread and the connection is still there of like, this was definitely in, you know, the author's mind when she was writing about Lupin being turned as a yeah. kid. Yeah. It is such an interesting point because we talk a lot about mother figures in the Potter series, but I don't feel like we have a lot of conversations about father figures. Mm. And it would be interesting to keep an eye on this throughout the rest of our chapter by chapter to kind of note is the theme of fathers in Harry Potter that the sons are paying for the sins of their fathers? Is that what's happening here? I mean, think about the kind of father that Lupin himself turns out to be, um, you know, obviously he's not around to watch his son grow up and it's admirable that he fought in the Battle of Hogwarts. But prior to that, we saw a very undesirable side of Lupin when he was contemplating leaving his wife and newborn baby to go camping with the trio. <laughs> Like, mm -hmm. because he was scared, because he was scared. So it's it's interesting to think about how, you know, the the repercussions of perhaps Lupin's relationship with his own father kind of reverberate throughout the generations here. That's interesting. Um, when you ask about whether the fathers and what role they play in the series has to do with their sons, I think about Voldemort, probably one of the worst yep. villains. But his dad is actually not guilty of much. Um, his dad was coerced by a love potion into this relationship with uh, the village tramp and really just kind of in a moment of clarity rejected her. And that was what Voldemort blames as being the, you know, the whole downfall of everything. But you almost really can't blame Tom Riddle Sr. No. for his reaction after what had occurred. Voldemort definitely um, it, does. He blames him for being a muggle. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that too. That too. The idea being that if Tom Riddle Sr. were somehow a wizard, he would have been either okay with Merope, uh, or somehow more tolerant, which who knows. We see it with Snape as well, right? With mm, Tobias yeah. being very abusive towards Eileen Prince as well as towards Snape at times, it seems. So... Clearly, that would have an effect on Snape and, and how he matured and grew up and his outlook um, towards other people. Little plug for my Slytherin Spotify playlist, which is titled Slith Life, The Sins of Somebody Else's Past. So, oh, man, <laughs> check okay. that out. On Everybody Spotify. listen to that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we're going to take a little break and I can't believe I'm saying this, but I did just see kids starting to go back to school on my own town. So I guess it's true. What? It's crazy. I know. August 7th, they went back. I'm like, whoa. On the other hand, I'm like, yeah, get out of here. I, I don't want to see you during the day. So it's fine. Um, <laughs> fall is right around the corner and HelloFresh is here to help you plan for the busy season ahead with tasty dishes delivered to your door. Simply choose your recipes and pick your delivery date, then lay back and enjoy the last days of summer knowing dinner is covered. Banish the end of summer blues with HelloFresh. 
No need to stress about how you'll handle it all this fall because HelloFresh takes care of the meal planning and delivers pre-portioned ingredients right to your home. So whipping up a homemade meal is a cinch. The key to dinnertime success? Variety. HelloFresh keeps your taste buds on their toes with 40 chef-crafted recipes to select from every week. From family-friendly to fit and wholesome, you'll always find new and exciting recipes to try and love. I love getting HelloFresh deliveries. They're individually packaged, so they, they're easy to store separately in the fridge, and they come up with truly unique recipe ideas I'd never tried before I would never have thought of. They put fun twists on old favorites to make you go, whoa, when biting in. Plus, it's so nice to easily cook something at the end of a long day without having to worry if you're coming up with something good or not. I also just love not looking at a screen for a while and focusing on the real world and working with my hands after a long day of work. It just checks a lot of boxes. This is my go-to meal delivery kit for loads of reasons I haven't even mentioned, like all the flexibility and customizability and recipes, the ability to skip weeks for delivery, and so much more. We have a slightly different promo code this week, so pay attention. Go to oh. HelloFresh.com. Pay attention, Eric. HelloFresh.com slash 50Muggle and use code 50Muggle for 50% off plus free shipping. Again, go to HelloFresh.com slash 50Muggle and use code 50Muggle for 50% off plus free shipping. HelloFresh is America's number one meal kit. Well, 50 Muggles is how many people turned up at our MuggleCast Live uh, event down <laughs> yeah. in our, me- our meetup. Sponsored by HelloFresh. I was going to ask if uh, that's our rapper name, Finny Muggle. Finny, Finny Muggle. Muggle. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody get on that. The possibilities are endless. AI, AI art. Somebody do it. Oh, God. Okay. <laughs> It's time now to talk about what I am calling the greatest hoax ever perpetrated in Hogsmeade Village, or maybe against Hogsmeade Village. We're going to find out. Here's a quote from this chapter in Prisoner of Azkaban. This house, Lupin looked miserably around the room. The tunnel that leads to it, they were built for my use. Once a month, I was smuggled out of the castle into this place to transform. The tree was placed at the tunnel mouth to stop anyone coming across me while I was dangerous. So, Jason, you've got some questions here. <laughs> yes. I was wondering, why are they using a Whomping Willow as the guardian of the entrance to this tunnel? It seems like they could have used some kind of spell or, like, repelling charm, some kind of portrait that recognizes only Lupin. I don't know. Something. Why a Whomping Willow? Is it just because Dumbledore loves the drama of a violent tree? Yes. Absolutely. (laughs) That is the answer. (laughs) And I love this theme we have picked up on in chapter by chapter. Dumbledore (laughs) loves the chaos. He loves some mess going on around the school. And I picture just Pillsbury Doughboy Dumbledore just being like, whoo-hoo, this is going to be fun. Like, you know, when you poke the Pillsbury. (laughs) (laughs) It's going to be a little danger. (laughs) (laughs) Whoo-hoo-hoo. (laughs) <laughs> but what was the in character what's the what's the canon explanation like what's the like what's the contemporaneous explanation for why this tree is there what did the fifth sixth or seventh year hogwarts students think about this like if you're coming to hogwarts the first time and yeah there's a whomping willow on the ground it's like harry and ron discovering their second year <laughs> quite directly um it's just there it's just hogwarts it's just this security nightmare normal everyday thing but if you're first putting it there doesn't that draw attention actually to what you're trying to do in concealing a secret pathway or what would Dumbledore have said to explain it at the start of term feast? Could they, could he just said it magically came out of nowhere? Like it just grew really big, Maybe. really quick. <laughs> I guess. Yeah. I guess that's believable in the wizarding world. Maybe he would have said that it's like an endangered species of plant and don't get near it. Like we've agreed to host to like bring willows back to the forefront kind of a thing. Is there's like tree nurseries are totally a thing. Yeah. Like this is an endangered species. Uh, Sprout thought this would be a good idea. It'd be a good lesson for the students. It'd be all one big lie and you all would get to gleefully up the Dumbledore lie count. But it's a it's a good lie. Well, Good we're going to do that anyway. <laughs> He's headmaster, though. Nobody's going to question his decisions. It's if he wants to no. plant a tree, let him plant a tree, right? 
Let him play in a dangerous tree. It's fine. Well, there's this thing here, but like it hits back is the thing. Well, most things that Hogwarts hit back hit like, back or can damage good, you in some way. I, I guess my, my yeah. greater question is why was it never removed after uh, Lupin left? Why is well, it on the Hogwarts grounds years and years later? It's a security I, nightmare. I think it was because it was so successful, right, at actually achieving what it set out to do. So the idea is, although we don't hear about any other werewolf students. Uh, coming throughout the years, which would actually solve the big gaping plot hole here. Um, you know, like what it, it just is perfect. They already had it in place, so they kept it. Makes sense to me. Here's another quote from Lupin. My transformations in those days were terrible. It is very painful to turn into a werewolf. I was separated from humans to bite, so I bit and scratched myself instead. The villagers heard the noise, meaning uh, the villagers of Hogsmeade, heard the noise and the screaming and thought they were hearing particularly violent spirits, Dumbledore encouraged the rumor. Even now, when the house has been silent for years, the villagers don't dare approach it. So this is a lie that actually worked too well in my mind. This is like so good. If the shack was built the same year that Lupin came, which is what he says, he says, this house and the tunnel were built for me. A little bit more than just lying had to have occurred here. I think this is like memory charm territory. You have to convince. Mm. We've heard from earlier in the book that the Shrieking Shack is one of the oldest, most haunted dwellings in Britain. But if it's from the 70s, there's probably like a conversation pit. It's probably like very janky. Conversation pit. Like, yeah, you know, all those 70s features. Yeah, I like, saw Mad Men. I know what you're talking well, about. Well, yeah, gross, but not haunted. <laughs> you know, an eyesore, sure, but not the most haunted dwelling in Britain. I'm thinking that you need to almost convince an entire, like, village, right? Which is a close-knit community. It's the only all-wizarding community in Britain that this house always was there. Or something, right? Like, new houses don't get haunted. So what exactly went into this whole hoax? Yeah, it's so interesting that you bring that up. So it did they definitively say that the Shrieking Shack was built for Lupin? He said the house and the tunnel were, I'll get the exact quote, but yeah, he says it was built for me. Wow. Yeah, at the top of this yeah. header here, this okay. house, the tunnel that leads to it, they were yeah. built for me. Yeah. For my okay. use. Wow. Right? The Lupin that Shack. That is so interesting. I never picked up on that, but you're right. There's this whole like subtextual question about, okay, well then how were people convinced that this happened? It had to be some kind of memory charm or something, some kind of manipulation. Did he like go around and place false memories? Like for these people? are crimes. These are yeah. crimes. But yeah, I mean, it, it just comes crimes from this one line. Lord. reading. I mean, here's the thing. I really just want to up the Dumbledore lie count, which we've been hating. Like, <laughs> we've we've failed to do this entire book, probably most of Chamber, actually. Like, the lie count, what is it, at eight? And it has been eight since, like, Sorcerer's Stone. We need to up it. And if there's, like, memory charms involved, I'm suggesting we up it by, like, ten. You know, he lied oh, to at least stop. ten people. One. He lied to I'll at least ten one. people. Ten? Ten? Well, it's a big lie. But here's the thing. Okay, Nearly Headless Nick also is running interference. Ron asks him earlier in the book about the Shrieking Shack. And Nick says to Ron, I heard a really dangerous crowd hangs out there. And I'm thinking, what's the backstory here? Because does Nick actually believe that there's rough spirits, which convincing ghosts that there's rough ghosts somewhere is another feat in and of itself? Or since Lupin was a Gryffindor... Did Dumbledore come to Nick and he was saying as the Gryffindor ghost, can you protect the anonymity of this student by starting to tell people that the shack is haunted, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Like, is there a narrative there where it's like Dumbledore also recruits the ghosts to tell other ghosts that that shack is haunted? Because you just get the Shrieking Shack, which has been empty and only ever was vac vacant or only ever was in use for the first seven years that it existed. But it's the most haunted dwelling in Britain. Well, I'm I'm wondering if it's like maybe the house is new, but maybe the site, the land, the area was haunted before something like, have you seen the movie Poltergeist where they like built yeah. that new yeah. house on? I'm wondering if it's some kind of situation like that that's happening or I don't know. 
<laughs> well, I like that because like if you're disturbing the sacred land or this haunted land with the house, of course, the spirits on the land that was there and undisturbed are going to be annoyed about the shrieking shack and thus could inhabit it and and cause a stir. Yeah. And I, I think part of this could be chalked up to community superstition. We all had a haunted house that we a haunted house that we were aware of as kids, right? There was always a rumor that some house in your neighborhood or in your community was haunted. And there's not really any good reason for believing that apart from the fact that everybody else believed it. Yeah. <laughs> so when you're expecting to see creepy things, you will see creepy things. You're kind of putting the thought in your head and you're thus sort of perceiving that which you expect to perceive. So that's part of this, I think. I mean, the screams were real for the about se- were. For, for about seven yeah. years, and they can have sounded great, especially when Lupin talks about what he was doing to himself. Um, obviously, it's like a huge deterrent, but it somehow morphed in its um, storytelling to be the most haunted dwelling in Britain, which may itself be a commentary on how the author feels about haunted houses, right? There's secretly absolutely nothing, in the- which... You know, it's actually funny to me. Like, I still find that very funny that the most haunted dwelling in Britain just, you know, has been disused and it just looks a little. I, little I think it's just also another statement on things aren't always what they appear to be, right? Like, that is a major mm. theme that runs throughout the course of this particular book that, and, and probably a, a lot throughout the series, that, that things aren't always what they seem to be. But I'm, you know, Eric, you were talking about how Lupin is scratching biting doing all these terrible things to himself do no other students notice this like presumably when he comes back from the shrieking shack and i know madame pomfrey is with him for yeah a a period of time but one would assume that regardless of how good her work is students would notice that lupin is disappearing for periods of time and then coming back to school and looking like he's you know been in some sort of terrible accident well, makeup I, covering it up with just like yeah. long sleeves. Well, minor cuts and bruises because what what does Madame Pomfrey say? She can heal wounds in an instant, uh, or That's even mend true. bones. Like if you can do that kind of magic, there's a potion that'll heal you like pretty much instantly. They will have noticed Lupin uh, the same thing that uh, Harry notices his professor, uh, looking more ragged and paler than ever with shabbier clothing. Um, but the cuts and bruises aspect, I think, will mostly have been taken care of by Madame Pomfrey, who was last week's Quizage question, taking him to and from uh, the shack. But here's what happens is after the first year when we're going to get into this as a second half of our discussion, when the rest of Lupin's friends notice what he is, there's immediately that wall of protection around him. So I don't think anybody would have been able to view Lupin coming off of his werewolf transformation uh, with any degree of scrutiny or closeness because you have the Marauders kind of doing like a flying V and protecting him. Uh, I think that once they discovered Lupin's secret, they would have taken effort to make sure nobody else did, Um, which is why it took forever for the only person who ever did discover it, Snape, uh, to to learn it was years later because they would have protected it. So, but uh, yeah, just wrapping up this hoax, here's what I think went down. Uh, I think that Dumbledore convinced Madame Rosmerta uh, to say that the kitchen is broken uh, at the three broomsticks. And the only place people could go to in Hogsmeade was the Hog's Head, where Dumbledore's brother is the chef. And Dumbledore's brother fed them all a potion that made them forget that the building wasn't always there. And then they woke up saying, oh, yeah, that shrieking shack's always been there. And that's how they did it. Okay. Yeah. (laughs) I I actually kind of like it. Again, it fits in with this theme of Dumbledrama. Yes. Dumbledrama. (laughs) Dumbledrama. Has that been an episode title yet? I don't think Maybe. so. Maybe we're going to cue the lightning because I'm glad you agree. I declare canon. Wait, do you want to declare canon or Dumbledore lie count? Because we still have to formally do that as oh, well. Oh, he lied. Okay. All right. <laughs> Please, trust me. You liar. <laughs> okay. 
<laughs> that needs a lightning bolt at the end of it, I think, Is too. It? it does, yeah. <laughs> the Dumbledore lie count has officially been updated for the first time since, Yay! I don't know, 2021. It is now at <laughs> nine <laughs> times. But here's my question. Is the lie for the Shrieking Shack or is the lie to the rest of the student body that Lupin is a werewolf? <sighs> okay, there's two lies. D, all of the above. I think te- I think technically there's two lies. Please, Harry, trust me. <laughs> you liar! Okay, but we're done. I don't think we're going to get another opportunity for, uh, for this book. So Dumbledore Lie Count is now at 10. Yeah, don't worry. When we get to Order of the Phoenix, we're going to be racking them up. <laughs> it's like every other sentence in that book. All right, it's up to the milestone 10. Congratulations, everybody. 10. I just have no fight left in me. I'm just... <laughs> I'm... <sighs> I'm on the floor. You guys beat me up. Uh, Dumbledore made us those cookies at Christmas <laughs> and we still haven't forgiven him. No cookies this year. It's fine. <laughs> it's fine for my wallet. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> I want those cookies, though. Oh, I'm okay. at least apologetic about it. Like, Andrew, you've been a good sport. So <laughs> we know what happens with the rest of this chapter. And again, it's a short chapter. Not a lot happens. But Harry's dad this is Harry's investment. He finds out that his dad, he says, my father too? Harry's invested in this story because it offers him the slimmest of insights into what James was like as a person. So Harry is hooked. But this whole Animagus thing, we actually received the transformation process on how to become an Animagi from Wizarding World. It might have actually, it might have been Potter No More, but it might actually have been the Wizarding World. When I look at the uh, document, it, or the uh, the web page, it says written by the Wizarding World team. So I also wonder if this was originally from J.K. Rowling or not. And published on March 10th, 2020, yeah. which I think was after they got rid of Pottermore. So, so there's a slight question of how canonical is this, but I really don't think Wizarding World, which often did like those low ball listicle type things, would have really written this if it weren't yeah. from the author. It's so specific. There's yeah. no way like they hired somebody to just like pull this out of thin air. Yeah. But who would like to kind of discuss? It took the Marauders three years from their second to their fifth year to do all of this. And you'll understand why when we. This thing is insane. Yeah. And Jason <laughs> yeah. did a great job of offering some extra analysis for each step, almost every step. So I'm looking forward let's, to hearing what you have yeah, to say. Let's, Jason. let's do a, like a rotating host thing of the steps. We'll start with Andrew. Okay, so step one is do your homework in Transfiguration and Potions at least. Becoming an Animagus requires a witch or wizard to be skilled in both these areas in order to stand a chance of achieving such a complex transformation. This reminds me of when Tonks is talking about how to be a metamorphmagus and how she's very clumsy and isn't good at most magic, but the ones that make you uh, more sneaky and things are definitely the ones like self-transfiguration. Okay, and here's an interesting one and probably my favorite step. Step two, carry a single mandrake leaf in your mouth for an entire month from full moon to full moon. Shout out to full moons. Uh, Yeah, we're serious. If you swallow the leaf or remove it from your mouth at any point, you have to start the thing again. No one likes to see that happen. You then have to find a quote, small crystal file that receives the pure rays of the moon, put your saliva-filled leaf inside, and add one of your own hairs. This is some straight Ew. up... Nope. This is some straight up werewolf slash polyjuice slash whatever else is going on here uh, process, and I love it. I, I'm out. I'm out, though, at step oh. two of eight. Because think about, like, I like chewing gum. Think about how how you want to get rid of the gum after like 30 45 minutes yeah. in your mouth you got to keep that mandrake leaf in your mouth for a whole month think of how tasteless that's going to be what about eating other food you got to like store it like a chipmunk in the side of your mouth before you swallow the rest of your food this is crazy or what about brushing your teeth Right. Did James, Sirius, and Peter just have like stank breath for an entire month? There are charms for that. You can you can <laughs> evanesco the 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 bad breath, can't you? And there's a uh, <laughs> running to poop mountain running joke. Let's call it <laughs> that. Um, people in Britain have bad teeth. Peace and love. Peace and love. Oh, oh. Right, right. Mm-hmm. 
Well, maybe yeah. that maybe everybody's trying to become an animagus. <laughs> <laughs> uh, please forward all complaints to Andrew at MuggleCast at gmail.com. <laughs> yes, that's totally a real email address. Yes. <laughs> so, Jason, you now. had some thoughts on uh, this Mandrake thing. Yeah, so I was just curious about all these different ingredients that are happening here because I feel like um, the author is very specific when she chooses different ingredients for things or, you know, there's always intention behind it. So I was just looking at like, what are mandrakes? Um, They come up in book two and then they're again in here. So um, they were once considered the most important plant of the Mediterranean region. They were used in a variety of medicinal um, purposes as well as like witchcraft Um, it was believed that mandrakes could cure almost everything. They could foretell the future and they could also shield a soldier in battle. Um, so I just thought that was really interesting. That is, it's a real palate cleanser. (laughs) (laughs) It's something. Yeah. They definitely um, need one after a month. (laughs) Oh God. Right. And then also hair comes up in many potions in this series and i was just wondering yeah like what is that all about so it's traditionally been a pretty important part of a lot of different witchcraft and is used in a lot of potions throughout history um it symbolizes physical strength and virility so the other thing about like knowing that james uh peter and sirius were doing this in order to help their friend who's a werewolf whose cycle is judged by the moon there's something really interesting in knowing that the crystal violet has to be filled at the full moon they have to wear the mandrake leaf uh won't wear it (laughs) put it in their mouth for a month like from full moon to full moon it's really interesting it's almost as if they're harnessing it's almost as if this whole process goes by the same magic that causes werewolves to transform uh more or less like that the moon cycles are viewed as this very transformative time but of course there's more that we could talk about about how that affects uh muggle humans as well i will say too how did the children get away with it like wouldn't the teachers have noticed that james doesn't speak for a month or sounds a little funky or how would you know did they do it at the same month or did they alternate because one student being kind of quiet like even james a huge troublemaker kind of quiet okay but all four of them or sorry three of the four of them not speaking for a month did they convince the teachers they were on like a speaking strike like what exactly why didn't that raise more alarm bells maybe they did it maybe they like stayed at hogwarts over the winter holidays and did it then when no one was there maybe they did it over the summer hmm All right, who's going to read step three? I'll read it. Add a silver teaspoon of dew from a place that the sun don't shine. Oh, sorry, that neither (laughs) sunlight nor human feet have touched for a full seven days. And if that wasn't hard enough, you then have to add the chrysalis of a death. A croissant. Croissant, excuse me. Of a death's (laughs) head. Oh, croissant. Oh, we're into baking now. (laughs) To the crystal file as well. Then put this mixture in a quiet, dark place and leave it alone until the next electrical storm. And really leave it alone. Don't even look at it. Don't even think about looking at it. (laughs) Okay, and I want to amend what I said about Rowling writing this. I bet they she gave them rough notes, like the facts, the bare bones facts, and then they punched it up with some color because clearly a lot of this was not written by Rowling. Don't even look at it. Don't even think about looking at it. (laughs) Don't even think about it. (laughs) <laughs> or, but, or yes, we're serious in step two. Yeah, right, right. But do from a place that neither sunlight nor human feet have touched. I don't even know how you'd find such a place. And before a like cave. television, how do you know when an electrical storm is going to occur? Specifically an electrical storm. Like not all storms presumably are electrical storms. So I don't even know. I'm lost. I would fail. You have to keep your eye out on the sky. A chrysalis is uh, the insect... Uh, pupa, so the transformation from egg to caterpillar to chrysalis in an adult. So it's be, it's once they're a caterpillar before they um, become a butterfly. What about the moths, Jason? 
So, yeah, so Death's Head Hawk Moths, that sounds really intense to me. So I was like, what is that? <laughs> They're these huge, crazy moths that are very common in Britain, apparently. They have you been used in literature throughout history, including Shakespeare, to symbolize um, death and kind of the fear of death which is why they're called death's head hawk moths. If you look on their back, they have a patterning that kind of looks like a skull. So I was wondering, yeah, like, could that symbolize kind of the death of your being and your rebirth as your animagus? I could definitely see that. Yeah. Yeah, Like if you look at uh, death, the tarot card, it means change, transformation, Mm -hmm. a new beginning. Can you get one of these in Animal Crossing? (laughs) (laughs) Uh, They are Hufflepuff colors. That's kind of fun. No, that's a really good call out. Thanks for looking that up, Jason. So step four, while waiting for the transfiguration to begin, you must place your wand tip over your heart every sunrise and sundown and speak the following incantation. Amato animo an... Animato Animagus. Oh man, I need to do that. Oh, again. you failed. You got to start I, all the way at the beginning failed. again. I failed. Not from New the Mandric beginning. Leaf. Start over at step one. <laughs> no. <laughs> Amato Animo Animato Animagus. There you go. If you keep repeating your incantation, there will come a time when, with the touch of the wand tip to the chest, a second heartbeat may be sensed. Don't change anything. Keep going. Keep waiting for that storm. <laughs> Wow, inspiring. And Jason, you have another storm call out here. Yeah, so lightning storms also in literature and and historically kind of represent uncertainty, madness, or chaos. Cool. 1.21 gigawatts. (laughs) (laughs) I will say, I think this is a great thing to include in Hogwarts Legacy. Yeah. To make this a mission. Absolutely not. An eight-step quest. The, all of this, mission? I was actually thinking that while reading through this list. What else are you going to do on a, on a DLC? If I saw this quest, I would be like, I'm never, I'm never beating that. I'm never doing oh that one. God. It's too much work. Come on. No, I would love it. I'm a completionist. So I, I, I would for it. You have love to, you, it. You have to hold down L2 for a month. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, to exactly. keep it under your tongue for a month. You can't even sit down in this game, but you gotta you gotta hold the mandrake root under your tongue. And then at sunrise and sunset, every day you have to uh, take your controller and hold it against your heart and repeat this incantation. Oh you, you, you shake the controller to the syllables. Amato, anemo, animato, animato. <laughs> All right, Jason, do you want to take step five? As soon as lightning appears in the sky... Go to the place where you've hidden your crystal file. At last, if you've done everything right, then you will discover a mouthful of blood red potion inside it. Then move somewhere where you aren't going to alarm anyone or place yourself in physical danger during your transformation. An animagus transformation party is definitely a bad idea. And to that, I say an Animagus transformation party sounds so fun. I'm wondering if the Marauders did this. Oh, they did. It's it's like a reveal, right? Because you find out what you're going to turn into. An animal reveal party. Yeah. (laughs) With potential (laughs) devastating consequences. A forest could burn down. Um Yeah, this whole thing, like, I knew where this was going when you, but once you put, like, the moth in the vial or the chrysalis stage and then, like, it becomes a potion. Yeah, sorry, you're going to have to drink the potion, guys. We need to come up with a playlist for the party. I'm thinking, like, Roar by Katy Perry. Oh, Um, this is such a thing that we need to do. Maybe that's what I'll do instead of Ravenclaw Part 2. I'll do a Spotify playlist for the Animagus Transformation Party. U2 has a song called Electrical Storm. Oh Katy Perry God. also did a song for the Pokemon movie called Electric. Uh, we could find something about like eating leaves or something. There's an electric slide. Step six, place your wand tip against your heart and speak the incantation. Amato, Animo, Animo, <laughs> and Amato, and Amagus, yeah. and drink the potion. You will then feel fiery pain, lucky you, and an intense double heartbeat. Oh, no. I don't need like a heart palpitation going on. 
And uh, Jason, again, a great breakdown here of what each of these words means. Yeah, so it's all Latin, as we know. We love we love Latin in these series. So, um, a motto is "I love" or "I am obliged to." Animo means animal. Animato means I animate or I fill with breath or life. And then animagus is a portmanteau of, I don't know if I'm saying that word right, but it's of, of animo and magus, which is animal and wizard. So all together, this, this incantation makes a lot of sense. It's saying, like, I love the animal, I animate it, I fill it with the breath of life, and now I'm an animal wizard. Wow. Yeah, that's really cool. I love how this establishes the Animagus as like a separate life and entity altogether. Yeah, and this is where we get into the real dangers, uh, which is why they warn against Animagus parties. Step seven leads into it, but it's step eight that's truly terrifying. Step seven is the shape of the creature into which you will shortly transform will appear in your mind. The instructions then warn, you must show no fear. It is too late now to escape the change you have willed. Yikes. (laughs) Do not pass go. Yikes is part of the step, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. (laughs) I feel like this should only have seven steps if it isn't. Yeah, well, yeah. step seven's kind of a BS step. Let's move. And we'll combine the two together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So step eight, when your transformation is complete, you are strongly advised to pick up your wand and hide it somewhere safe so you can find it post-transformation. To return to human form, visualize your human self as clearly as you can. Don't worry. If you don't change back immediately with practice, you'll be able to slip in and out of your animal form at will simply by visualizing the creature. Once you're an advanced animagus, you should be able to transform without your wand. Yeah, so I was thinking, like, depending on what animal you turn into, like, what if you turn into a worm or a caterpillar and they're like, okay, and then hide your wand. It's like, how am I, <laughs> how am I going to hide my wand as a worm? Uh, I Yeah. I think you, you hide it outside of yourself. Like, you hide it. Like, bury it somewhere. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, am I doing that keep... after my transformation as a worm? Like, am I out there as a worm, like digging a well, hole and I mean, putting my wand in it? Right, right. The worms do go into the ground themselves, right? So I, I see what you're saying, but yeah, because your I wand needs to be placed against your heart when you initiate the transformation, but then you right. need a quick place to so stow it before p- the. It's another step, really. It's hide it, your wand at the same time point, as you're though. transforming. Yeah. Mm-hmm. What if you're not? Yeah, I, I guess that that part of it makes more sense, Andrew. Versus once you're fully transformed, because think of Rita Skeeter. How would she hide her wand as something so small? Mm-hmm. You would not have the strength to be able to do that. Mm-hmm. So well, I'm going to be something very large, so I'm not going to have this problem. I see. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah, we're going to talk about did, what Patronus is. We're going to. I did want to mention too that you know, if we're connecting the threads a bit, we do get introduced. Uh, to an animagus in the very first chapter of this series in Professor McGonagall, but we're not explicitly told what it is. And that's something that J.K. Rowling is is very good at doing. We're talking about hiding things in plain sight. Uh, it definitely happens with McGonagall in the first chapter of Sorcerer's Stone. That's a great point. So I think canonically, we can all agree that the Marauders have each seen each other naked. <laughs> Just yeah, throwing that out sure. there. <laughs> Listen, <laughs> no the further wolves- point. The Wolf Star shippers are all about it. <laughs> but um, they just called anyway. me off guard. I was like, oh, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Eric, well, yeah. And Jason, you have a, a, another point here just about what if your animal form is like a water dwelling creature that can't breathe above ground and you didn't know it until this very moment when you're transforming and it's like, wait, I'm a fish. I have to find a lake. Right or a dolphin, and I'm like, I need seawater. I can't just go in the Great Lake at Hogwarts. Like that probably won't work. I don't know. Maybe, maybe a dolphin. Maybe would. to be safe, you you need to be like on a shoreline. So if you do transform into a sea creature, you can just kind of toss yourself into the water when it yeah. happens. Yeah. If you transform into a whale, then you're just a beached whale. 
Oh. <laughs> oh, that explains all the beached whales we keep seeing. They're animagus. <laughs> so and they actually didn't come from the ocean. They were just on the coast and they transformed. <laughs> Figured it out. Honestly, after after reading about this whole process, it does make sense why a few weeks ago, Quizich answer, uh, seven people have done this in the last century. Like, really not that many. Um, it's it probably doesn't appeal to a lot of people. I'd be interested in picking McGonagall's brain about why she did it, but mm. it's kind of a lot of work and you may not like the reward. I get part of me wonders what, how much time you have between step seven and step eight, because if you are able to visualize what you are, maybe Jason, then you can get yourself to the appropriate location before you fully transform. So if you are a fish or a dolphin or any other sea creature, you can find your way to the ocean or to a lake. But that's just my head cannon. So we have a few uh, animagus points, but first I do want to ask what Patronus or <laughs> what animagus, I've been using that word the whole time. What animagus would we all think that we would be? Well, I'm just going to say what I want to be, which is an orca whale because oh, I yeah. loved them as a child and I want to be taking down yachts across the world. And- <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Andrew wants to eat the rich. With, with, a, with a righteous fury. <laughs> oh my God. Okay, that's great. Well, the, this whole talk about dolphins and whales interests me because I think living in the water or being able to survive underwater and go deep would be probably the most exciting thing for me next to flying, which leads to my choice. So I figured I would want to fly. And in consulting Meg about like what I'm like, but is it really realistic for me to be a bird? I feel like an owl is like to one certain way or an eagle is to like another certain way. And Meg had the idea and I agree with it immediately. I would be a pigeon because they're urbanites. They're very social creatures. And uh, you often catch them, especially in the colder months, cuddling. So that's the sweet explanation. But yeah, I think Pigeon 100% would be my animagus form. I love that. Uh, Mine would be a raccoon. Um, This is for a couple of different reasons. Uh, First of all, when I think about raccoons, the word that immediately comes to mind is resourceful. And that's something that I value. So Ooh. I could see myself doing that. The other side of this is I love Rocket Raccoon. So there's that connection. Um, but like you, Eric, I also consulted my significant other and asking, hey, what would my animagus be? And he was like, you'd be a raccoon. <laughs> and I was like, are you saying I'm a trash panda? <laughs> that was my first i'm like okay laura choose to be a trash panda all right here we go listen they're adorable though yeah at the are. end of the day they're they are trash pandas but you know they make the best with what they have and they're so uh, cute i know and they're very cute so i i could see myself being a raccoon plus their little hands are so adorable they do have I little was, hands i was gonna mention their little <laughs> hands they're so cute <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 and no. You wouldn't hang out with me? No, I wouldn't. I I swim out to sea or I'd eat you. <laughs> oh. Uh I chose a lemur. Oh. They're very cute. And uh Yeah, I mean, I, I like the uh, ability to climb, get into uh tough places and uh it actually when I was doing some research says that for some folks, lemurs are the symbol of good luck uh-huh. and they connote kindness, respect, positivity, and the importance of remembering familial connections while honoring one's teachers and elders. So it's perfect for you. They're also really nasty to humans. So oh. <laughs> I thought that, uh, you know, that kind of split dynamic worked. Yeah. yeah. I don't blame them, honestly. I mean, no. They get one island. They live on Madagascar. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. And then, Jason, we got your answer earlier, but anything else you want to add about being a falcon? The falcons are very, like, strong, independent. They don't really um, need other 
people around them, which is kind of me. I don't know. I'm kind of, yeah. Independent. Um, okay. I get independent. that. Yeah. And then um, I just love the idea of being able to fly. Yeah. That sounds amazing. And I thought about being some sort of fish or dolphin or something, but the ocean scares me. So that's a no for me. You're right to be scared <laughs> about the ocean. Yeah. We don't know what's down there, like really down there. Well, I do because I'm. It's a <laughs> wild, crazy place. Andrew knows, but there's not a lot of natural predators for orca. orca whales. Andrew knows. That's that's yeah, all. Or- I'm orca, Andrew. <laughs> orca Andrew. Maybe orca that's the episode Andrew. title. Um, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, getting back to kind of the chapter, what's interesting is that the presence of Lupin's and Imagi friends helped him keep his head a little bit. Not physically, but mentally, he felt more like himself, so much so that they began to roam the grounds of the castle and the village, even. Lupin ceased to, he started to almost, it's almost as if somebody else was the alpha in Lupin's transformation. Yeah, I mean, to me, it seems a bit convenient that werewolves don't attack other animals. They only attack humans. Because I would imagine that a stag would seem a proper meal for a werewolf. I mean, you're right. You're not wrong. The idea that werewolves are only a threat to humans in this world is very, I always forget that. And then it's said, I think, at least twice in this chapter. So twice in nine pages, you know, it's important. But yeah, I don't know why. It's just convenience Mm -hmm. of the plot, I guess. Yeah. And I know it's mentioned, too, that there were a number of near misses when they were transformed, but it seemed very strange that nobody noticed a dog, a stag, a werewolf, and a rat running around together on the grounds of Hogwarts. The only thing I'll say to this is uh, bedtime, because it was always sort of after dark in that like moonlight hour, um, and we know how strict um, Hogwarts enforces its bed policy. And if anybody went to Dumbledore about it, he'd be like, ooh, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, like the only time Harry sees Sirius on the grounds of Hogwarts besides the Quidditch thing is late at night, like in the middle of the night that he, he and Crookshanks are working. So I just I just assume they operated like nocturnally, basically. But then Lupin is betraying Dumbledore's trust by going out of the Shrieking Shack as a werewolf. Yeah. And that's a big character moment for for Lupin. Lupin essentially is racked with guilt over the fact that he went out, that he doesn't tell Dumbledore the whole year that Sirius is an animators. So it's lies upon lies upon lies. Mm-hmm. I think we're ready for the odds and ends of the chapter. Um, something to note. So Snape reveals himself at the end of the chapter. He was able to come in wearing Harry's invisibility cloak, but... My question is, there's this loud creak, the door opens, Lupin walks right up to it and is like, mm, no one there. Does he not know like a spell or some way of checking? Because we later found out from the author that the way Dumbledore can quote see through Harry's cloak is that he's silently casting the hominum revelio charm and it's revealing to Dumbledore that there is someone there. And that's clearly not a trick Lupin picked up. And after all those years of experience with James's cloak, they still aren't able to like, I don't know, figure out that somebody really is there. Kind of questionable. It's a good point. But also I'm curious when Lupin discovers both Pettigrew and Sirius on the map, why does he not get Dumbledore? Mm. Just like, I'm going to go run off to the tree by myself. Yeah, (laughs) it's the same reason he forgets to take his potion, right? Contrivances of the plot. Well, he's also ashamed. Right. I think he later goes on to say that the reason he never confided in Dumbledore about any of this is because he was ashamed of taking advantage of Dumbledore's trust. And he didn't want to reveal himself as someone who had done something like that to someone who did so much for him. Yeah. And just as a note, there's this line in the chapter about uh, Lupin says the map Never lies. I think that makes it into the movie because now I'm hearing it in David Dulles's voice. But essentially, the map can see through the invisibility cloak. And that's how this whole thing got started. But if the map can see through the invisibility cloak and Moody's eye can see through the invisibility cloak, we find that out next chapter or next book. Um, then I think we have to finally divorce ourselves from the tale of the three brothers, magical cloakness of death himself not being able to see through it and find the brother because 
It's flawed. Everyone but Lupin can see through this cloak. <laughs> Apparently. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying. I'm trying to remember. I th- I think Gary Oldman actually says it. The map oh, never the lies. The map never lies. He's so committed to it, and it's mm-hmm. like, why you haven't explained mm-hmm. any of this? Just an interesting, odd, and end. And if we go to connecting the threads real quickly, we actually hear the Snape prank slash werewolf trick be explained a little bit. This is the moment that Dumbledore chose to tell Harry at the end of book one. The question about when, why Snape isn't a bad guy. Dumbledore says that Snape was protecting him because his father saved Snape's life. So we hear it from a different angle in this chapter. It's very satisfying, really pisses Snape off to the point where he reveals himself. Um, But it's just so interesting that just like McGonagall showing up as an enemy just in chapter one, all these ties to book one and the very beginning, the, the DNA has been in the series since the beginning. Very exciting. Yeah. And uh, one other thing I just wanted to call out is, you know, we spend a lot of time talking about everybody except Peter Pettigrew, mm. but Peter is really the key for them to be able to get through the Whomping Willow to the Shrieking Shack because he is small enough to go and touch that knot that we see Crookshanks on, you know, earlier in this book. And uh, it's very appropriate, though, as well, that he transforms into a rat because that is exactly what he is. <laughs> yes, he is. Yes, he is a rat. Um, yeah, you could do it with a stick, but it's much easier that uh, just to have Peter there. That concludes our discussion of the second shortest chapter in all the Harry Potter books. <laughs> it's time for MVP of the week. Yeah. I'm going to give it to Dumbledore for creating the sneaky snack, the sneaky shack. <laughs> Sneaky. Okay, that's the title. You know he's had a sneaky snack or two as well. Maybe Dumbledore's delights. Uh, But yeah, shout out to Dumbledore. I got to protect my boy since he was attacked twice this episode. Sneaky snack for the Dumble drama. Oh, man. (laughs) There we go. That could be the title. Going to give mine to Snape for successfully getting into the shack despite all these people uh, knowing what the cloak is. I'm going to give it to the superstition. Honestly, if it weren't for the superstition, whether it was a natural social phenomenon or whether Dumbledore uh, planted false memories in people's minds, the superstition is what kept the uh, facade of the Shrieking Shack being haunted alive and kept Lupin safe. Nice. I have to stick true to one of my Quizage names. If the shack is a rockin', don't come a knockin'. So I have to give it to the shack itself for doing its job and taking a beating at the hands of Werewolf Lupin. Yeah, and then I am giving mine to the Marauders for becoming Animagi. Anima- yep, that word. Anime guy, I think. Yeah, that word. Sneaky snack. Anime yeah. guy. <laughs> That's just, you know, they went through that whole crazy 27,000 step process, and that's pretty impressive. All right. Well, if you, the listener, have any feedback about today's episode or the chapters ahead, you can send an L to mugglecast at gmail.com, or you can use the contact form on mugglecast.com. To send a voice message, just record it using the voice memo app on your phone and then email us that file or use our phone number, which is 19203 Muggle. That's 19203684 four, five, three. And next week, we'll discuss chapter 19 of Prisoner of Azkaban, the servants of Lord Voldemort. And now it's time for some quizage. Last week's question, who did Snape see Lupin traveling with on the grounds of Hogwarts toward the Whomping Willow in the 1970s? Key part there, 1970s. And the correct answer was Madame Pomfrey or Poppy Pomfrey. Correct answers were submitted to us by Looney, Mocktail, Crew Cut, and Thongs, Laura, (laughs) Master of the Universe, Luke H., the 11-year-old, Raise the Dumby Lie Count, Snape's One Big Chance for Fame and Glory, Beautiful Glory, All Mine, All Mine, Snoopy199, Spoogetty, the only canon I remember is from all the young dudes, Wolfstar sitting in a whomping willow tree, your local (laughs) Irish leprechaun, Rublier Plank, Elizabeth K, Bob, and uh, definitely not Micah. Okay. Yeah, I, I trust it. I trust it. Next week's Quizage Question. 
who casts Expelliarmus against Snape in the Shrieking Shack? Submit your answer to us over on the MuggleCast website, MuggleCast.com slash Quizich, or click on Quizich from the main nav bar on MuggleCast.com. Don't forget, we would love your support on Patreon. Now, if you're a Spotify user and you support us on Patreon, you can get our Patreon audio, audio benefits right within Spotify, which is really nice. If you're a Spotify user and you don't support us on Patreon, tap that banner on the MuggleCast page within Spotify, and you'll be able to pledge and get these audio benefits. We do two bonus MuggleCast installments per month. We got the MuggleCast Collectors Club. I think maybe next week, if not next week, definitely the week after, we will reveal this year's wave of stickers that everybody in the Collectors Club will be getting. And of course, beanies will be going out to to our Slug Club patrons in another month or so, I think, maybe a month or two. Uh, definitely, f- they'll be ready for you for fall. Yay, I can't wait. Yeah, Yay. being in Salt Lake, Jason. And Jason, thanks so much for coming on the show today. Absolutely. This was so for fun. Yeah, it was great having you on. Thank you so much for all your contributions. And thanks for your support on Patreon. That's another perk at the Slug Club level. Uh, you can get in the queue to co-host MuggleCast one day couple other reminders if you're an apple podcast user and you don't support us on patreon for just 2.99 a month you can receive ad free and early access to mugglecast right within the apple podcast app patreon does offer more benefits but if you'd prefer to support us right within apple podcast we totally get it you can do it right there there is a free trial available as well just like there is on patreon and if you enjoy the show and think other muggles would too tell a friend about mugglecast We'd also appreciate if you left us a review in your favorite podcast app. And last but not least, don't forget to follow us on social media. We are MuggleCast on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, TikTok, and Threads. And there was a lot of great coverage led by Chloe on on the social media channels from LeakyCon. So be sure to check that out. Yeah, I was going to say a special shout out to Chloe for all the great coverage that she had uh, at LeakyCon, as well as jumping on the MuggleCast Live that we did uh, on Saturday, which we will be releasing over Labor Day weekend. Did I tell how much she crushed us on making the connection when we did that? There were some crazy connections given to us. Thanks, everybody, for listening. I'm Andrew. I'm Eric. I'm Micah. I'm Laura. And I'm Jason. Thanks again, Jason. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye, Bye, y'all. Well, another thing that that came to mind, though, too, with um, this being such a short chapter is just, I don't know, I totally lost my train of thought. So you can scrap that (laughs) out. That is a very good point, Micah. Well said. Let's clip that for social. Yeah. (laughs) Bloopers. We do bloopers, right? (laughs) It's fine. It happens.